Recording in progress. Hello everyone and welcome. This is the Network User Group webinar for May the 12th, 2022. Uh, my name is Bruce and with me today doing all the button pushing, the sweating, the heavy lifting, it's John. Hey John, how's it going? It's going great. Excellent. I'm just all pumped up and excited and ready to hear what you have to say you this fine like morning. It. You psychic, are you? All right. I am. Uh, also up early this morning. Um, not not perhaps as late. I didn't sleep in quite as much as John did. Um, but taking notes and doing some other admin type stuff that we need. It's Ted. Hey, Ted. How's it going? Very well. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, good morning. Right. We are doing questions and answers. So if you do have a question, uh, do go ahead and throw it up into the questions box and I will try and get to it as soon as possible. Um, there is a question there, but it came in before you arrived. It's from Mark Davidson. Ah, from Mark Davidson. Okay. Well, I can't see the question. So I will no. allow Mark to talk. Uh, before Mark gets going though, uh, just a quick word. So CIDC 2020 has been officially rescheduled. It's now happening 22 to 25 of September. Um, we, if, if we have any physical places left, it's going, I, I don't think there are. Well, there might be a few, three or four. Um, the, the venue is going to limit us to 60 based on local COVID rules. So I think we have like 59 signed up, although I imagine that some people won't be able to make it on site anymore. So if you do want to join us on site, you do need to get your registration in earlier rather than later. Uh, we'll obviously um, take the first 60 who want to come and who have registered. Um, but obviously also, if you don't want to come to Cape Town, um, it will be online. So do go ahead and register if you're not already registered for that. Now, talk to me, Mark. Hi, Bruce, how are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Oh, that's good. Um, okay, Bruce, I've got two questions. I'll get through, uh, let's do the second question because that's relatively quite easy. Um, just trying wanting to find out the NetTalk profiler that you do. Um, is it compatible with a new version of NetTalk? The network profiler that I do. The one that gives you a breakdown or a uh, breakdown of the commands that get run through. It's a pretty old one that you have. The Clarion uh, profiler. Yes. Ah, okay. So it's not a network thing. No, no, no. Uh, it's a okay. Uh, profiler, this guy okay. here. Yes. Uh, yes, it works on network. Sure. Uh, okay. So it works on the newer version because I know it's, uh, it said at one point I was working on legacy code. I just want to find out works on all the newer stuff as well. It works on clearing code, I'm not sure. Okay, no, that's that's just what I wanted to find out. Yeah, so yeah it works. Right. Profile is a, is a utility runs against the program, sure. All right, and then the bigger one is that I spoke to you a while ago about it, uh, was the translation engine, uh, the translation, um, and integrating right. the translation engine into NetTalk, um, and changing the standard button like the wizard uh, next button, uh, you'll form the wizard next button, how to yes. translate into different language and that type of thing. Okay. So the way we do translations is we don't do translations. Mm -hmm. See, that's just the sort of Zen-like thing you get when you come here. Right. Let's open up an example. See, it will do nicely. So there's, there's basically two methods. Now, when you just say you want to do translations, I presume you mean that 
your site will run in English for some people and in Afrikaans for other people or something like that. Correct. Exactly. Okay. That, yeah. So it's runtime translations. If you're mm. actually translating it, like if you're building a, an Afrikaans site that's just Afrikaans, you can, oh, excuse me, you can um, do things like translate the text on the buttons. Uh, that's, yes. Yeah. That's no, a no, thing. No, the English. And then if somebody selects, they want to view the site in Afrikaans, it must change everything in Afri to Afrikaans for them. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, so the, the buttons I was talking about there, you can change the text, but that's not what we, that would fix it to something else and we want variable. Okay. So basically there are two places where you will hook in a translation engine. So first I'm going to show you the places and then we're going to talk about what that means. Um, what it even means to hook something in. So let's go to translate. There's one in the web server. There's one in the web handler. Uh, and they both work exactly the same. So you'll see like all of these are coming through the translate method. Okay. So let's go down, let's find it. Where you go, got to go through all of this. There we go. Okay. And basically this, this method um, takes in a string and um, returns another string. Okay. This guy here. So let's take an example of, I'm, I'm going to do a translation <coughs> into the language called X. So I'm going to mm -hmm. say, uh, I'm going to make a string here, lock string, string 256. You can't, you can't change string parameters. You could, you must assign them. So lock string equals P string. Um, and in fact, I'm, I'm going to, because this is the language X in the language X, it just puts a little X on the front of everything. So insert becomes X insert and hello becomes X hello and so on. And then I'm just going to do that. Lock string. And then I'm going to return it. In fact, I can just do a return like that. Okay, so that, that's the, the code. Now, obviously this, this line we're gonna come back to in just a bit, because that's, you might have to do a more substantial translation than that. Um, and so I'm doing that in web server and I'm also gonna do it in web handler because stuff comes through here. Dum, 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 dum. And it's exactly the same thing um you you can get a bit fancier with with the strings i'm making them string 256 so if you wanted to translate something that's longer than that you know and so on but but this is the general idea so now if we run the program Bruce, uh, Johan says, Ted does all the work and, work and Bruce is lazy. That's pretty much sums it up there. Johan. That's, 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 how to, that's how to get through life, man. Yeah. Be lazy. Yeah, be lazy and let other people do hard work. It's a philosophy that served me very well over the years. That's what I'm doing wrong. This is where John should play the music just to, you know, while it's compiling. In fact, you know, the clarin ID would be better if it played music while it was compiling. Hey, John, don't you think that's a plugin we should, we should fit, work out how to do? While yes, the compiler is running, it should play music. Okay. Okay. Cunningly, it's getting two X's because it's going through both of them. It's going through the client and then the server. That's interesting, huh? So you can see, Johan, uh, Johan. you can see Mark, yeah. how everything is being translated. Yeah. Obviously not the data, and then that's the data. Um, all right, so let's, uh, so you wouldn't do both like that. 
I'm guessing you only have to do the server. All right, so now you have the hooks. The question becomes, what do you put in the hooks? And the answer is whatever translation engine you prefer can go in the hooks. So on the grounds that I've got it in the server, I'm gonna take it out the web handler. Um, whatever translation you've, engine you've got. So um, we're talking about various different things that are out there. The one I use is not surprisingly any text. Accessories, any text. So basically when we talk about an engine here, I don't really care where you're getting the translation from, that's on you. Um, any text, for example, is a local database that it, it's a class and it works and it just says, okay, well, um, you know, you're gonna translate the word insert into something else. You're gonna translate the word close into something else. And, and it's, it's got a, a data table and it's got, you know, original and translation in it. And you can have as many of those tables as you like, or actually they, they files on the disk. And um, so you can translate into different languages. You don't have to stop at two, you can do all 11. Um, mm -hmm. Here's the magic for translating text. Now, this is just using any text engine. I don't care which engine you use. If you have an engine and you like it and you're already using it, then you should carry on using that. If you don't have an engine already, then you should use any text because it's the best. Um, so you don't say so yourself. Oh, I do say so myself. <laughs> if I don't think it's the best, then who else will? Right? <laughs> so basically, you to do it to a web server application, you're gonna do, you're gonna add it to your app as normal, which is global extension and stuff. Um, there's a, in the, in the global extension web tab, you can add the languages you wanna support English and Afrikaans. Well, right. really so it really automatically Afrikaans. has the languages, you would just add what languages you want in there. Well, any text doesn't have any translation data in it. Oh, right? okay. it's, your, it's your data, but it's gonna build up a, a, a file and you're going to put the translations into that file. So it'll, right. you'll end up with a table with lots and lots and lots of records in it. Um, one record will say insert, one will say change, one will say delete and so on. Um, if I show you the desktop version, it's probably a little bit easier to see what I'm talking about. So let me go back there. If I open up the any text example. Now, you can't translate at runtime in the web server, but you mm. can translate, it's a, it's a table, so it's not rocket science, right? Um, mm. ABC, yes, that one will work. Um, but in the desktop version, well, the desktop, if you apply any text to a desktop program, you can translate at runtime. So if we run this, you'll get a feel for what I'm talking about. And, and as an aside to those watching, you don't always translate into another language. Sometimes you translate terminology. So sometimes we have like, some companies would call it a department and others want to call it a cost center and some want to call it a branch and those kind of things. Um, and they can actually translate English to English. So here I'm gonna pick from the language menu, Spanish. I'm gonna go to invoices and I'm gonna press a hotkey in this case control F10. And of course the Spanish people use a different date picture than, than what we're using here. See, I'm using two different date pictures there, but um, sometimes you go to a country and you say, oh no, 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 they use a different date picture. So let's just change that to D1, whoops, sorry. Yeah, D1. And notice I'm doing a global translation here. So anywhere there's a date picture of D3, it's gonna use D1. Um, and in fact, anywhere they've used date picture, I'm gonna change that to D1 as well. Now you can do that on a global basis or you can do it on a procedure basis. So here's a procedure browse invoice, um, but I'm gonna, in this case, do it to both. And let's do something else. Let's make this button here, the local translation. We'll make that as, why not? Okay. 
didn't refresh, but let's go. This is the invoices, invoice. So change the date format and it changed. Oops, I'm clicking the buttons. It changed the text there. Um, and if we go to here, it's changed that format to match that one. Um, and so on. Just a quick so, question with this translate, obviously when you use it on a web server, it will translate page by page as it gets in data, it will translate it each time. Um, isn't that pretty heavy on something that will be hit a lot of times? Yeah, so something like any text has got um, a built in cache. And so, and it's true for desktop or for web. Um, the first time it comes across a translation word, um, it loads it out the data table, but it stores that locally in the, in the memory cache. Um, and then from then on, it'll get it out of the memory cache. It won't go back to the disk for it every time. So it is, it, you, you don't see a huge performance. I mean, obviously it's, it's doing some work, but um, not nearly as much as you might think. Uh, let's go back to the documentation. So, da, da, da. Oh, there's actually an extension that you add to web handler for any text. And that, that does what you need. Um, and then at, at runtime, you have this underscore language session um, value, and you can set that to any of the languages. And you can set it wherever you like. So you can set it off a menu, you could set it off a button, you could tie it to users login. Uh, you know, when they log in, you automatically change the language because you know they use that language or whatever, whatever their preferred language is. So it's just a question of, um, of reading through the doc. That's changing languages, how to translate the text. Um, you can start the any text global translate, which will be us. You'll run that out of the server program, but you'll run it um, on the server. It's a it's a it's a uh, desktop window, if you like. So it's not run through the browser. You don't translate through the browser, but it'll build up a table of all your um, bits of of text, and you just translate them. It's a it's a simple edit in place. Uh, local translation is not supported in this case. It's only global for the web stuff. Um, and that's all there is to know, really. It's a very simple, straightforward process. Um, nothing over exciting. Essentially, any text has got support for network. So you, uh, this bit of thing code we added in there, um, in the, uh, we still have there. A bit of code we added, you don't even have to do it. That, that little extension template will do that for you. So you don't actually even have to do that when in the, it's the global um, extension will actually do all of that for you. Well, you don't need to, to do those two bits of embed code I showed at the beginning. I showed okay, you those so. because that just lets, that works for any engine, right? That works wherever you want to go and plug something in, you can. Um, yeah. You don't have to use any text. It just so happens that any text doesn't require you to do any work. It just add any text and add work through the, the instructions oh. and you're good to go. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right, great. That's that to answer my question. Then um, I'll try that out. Cool. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. All right. Um, well, we're going to keep our theme with Marks. We're going to talk to other Mark. Hey, Mark with a C, how's it going? It's good, thank you, Bruce. Um, uh, my question is there, uh, as I recall, there's a graceful close for a web server. There is. Uh, and uh, can you talk about how, what, what that does, what makes it graceful? All it means, it's this, uh, oh, I haven't even put it on here, the log. Okay, let's put one on. Uh, network graceful close there, there, and firing Bruce's first law of control templates straight out. Let's uh, move those over. So that's that's it's just a button that goes onto your web server procedure. What does it do? It will only allow this window to close when the number of connections, this number here, 
is basically zero. So what that means is that it won't terminate um, a connection that's active. So let's say someone's downloading a file or a report or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it'll allow that to finish. Now it's a specifically a connection, right? So most connections are very brief. These aren't sessions. We're not waiting for sessions to get to zero. We're waiting for connections to get to zero. Right. And so then my my follow on question is I'm I'm trying to implement a auto restart for the web server um, so it can do that in the middle of the night sometimes. And so um, is there a way to detect if there is a session that is sort of in progress? Sure. I mean, what you would be waiting for is that number there to get to zero. And that number is that is just that value. That's a local variable in this procedure. Okay. And so, so let's say you want to do it every day between one and four in the morning. As yep. soon as it gets sessions to zero, you do your um, you do your restart, reset to all your um, stuff. But yeah, you would just look at that thing. Make sure that thing is zero. Make sure number of connections is zero. Okay. That one and that one are the two important ones. All right. So now I'm I'm using I've adapted the OT poll or sorry the the polling program that the example program that will call out to a web server and yes. if I'm doing that every minute because I'm paranoid then my sessions never go to zero no they'll go to one but in and in that case that program should preserve the cookie right because okay. you don't want to start a new session with every poll. If you start a new session with every poll, your number of sessions will be like 15 times 60. Wait, yeah. 50, it'll be like 15 because you do a new one every minute. So no, yeah. you, you, you make sure that that thing's passing through a session ID um, and you wait for your sessions to get down to one because you, then you know it's only that one. Okay. Um, Makes sense. He, uh, it does. I am having. Uh, I'm thinking about how I collect that cookie so that oh. my polar can. Is it a it netweb? On. Is it a netweb client? It it is then you just set option auto cookie. So uh, in your network client, you'll have, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, before you do your first one, you'll set, well, but before you do all of them, actually, I, it doesn't really matter. Option auto cookie uh, equals true. And as long as the object, as long as you're not closing a window, as long as this object stays in scope, um, that will that will work. The first request will get a cookie, and all of the yep. rest ones will use that cookie. If you wanted to to if you wanted this object to go out of scope, you'd have to do an add cookie. So net dot add cookie session ID uh, mark whatever you want to set it to. Um, but but as long as this guy stays in scope, the cookie will stay true. Okay, I will. I will pursue that. Cool. Yeah. Everything's so, easy if you know how. Eh? Absolutely. Or if you don't know the answer, but if you know somebody that can tell <laughs> you the, the answer, answer, then that's, that's even fine. even better. Make them do the work, man. Well, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Exactly. Well, it's not who you know, it's if you know me. Well, it goes without saying. <laughs> oh, wait, I, sh I should say that because we all appreciate things. Your things that go without saying, I've found go better with saying. There you so go. So the saying goes. So the, um, here's the note. Thanks, Bruce. We, we, <laughs> I appreciate all the help, truly. Pleasure, Mark. Right, Ed. Hey, Ed, have you got a microphone? Can we hear you?
Okay, how about now? Yes, we can hear you. Good, okay. I had to hit the unmute button. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So has I'm having a real hard time getting SMTP email to work with Office 365. Yes, you are. And has anybody been successful with it? So let me let me um let me reframe your question. And and if you want to review, um Mill has been going through this. Um, a couple of recent Wednesdays, uh, we talked about yesterday in the open webinar that you might want to review because Mill is in a, a very much the similar position to you, except he's going through Gmail. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background. SMTP obviously is the world email protocol. Uh, two of the world's biggest email providers, one is Office uh, 365 or Outlook.com, it's sometimes called, um, and the other one is gmail.com. They have both decided that they don't like SMTP. And so they have effectively taken steps to either make it difficult to use or not allow it at all. So like Google at the end of the, of the month, this month is going to turn off SMTP completely. Um, I've been successfully using Gmail SMTP for a couple of years now. Yes, it'll, it'll die at the end of this month. That's oh, wow. the good news. Um, apparently, one never knows for sure because sometimes they say things and then it, it lasts, it lingers a little longer. But the reality is that um, Google don't like people using SMTP. It's not their business model. Their business model is they want you to use a browser um, and access the webmail part and sending mail through Google. And, and you must understand that both Google, Gmail, and Office are under enormous pressure from spammers um, right. who love to send a gazillion mails through these th engines because they're quite high reputational engines, but it's also trivial to create new accounts. Um, and so it's a whack-a-mole game for them. So they neither of them particularly like SMTP. Um, they both want you to rather switch to using their API. So there's a Gmail API and there's a Office 365 API. Um, that's a... It's, it's actually not hard to do. It's I'm resisting it more out of stubbornness than anything else because I believe that mail should use the mail protocol, <laughs> not everyone's private API. That's right. a slope where you essentially say, you end up with a situation where you go, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna support these four different vendors, whoever they happen to be, because they've all got unique APIs and there's no room for the little guy. Um, the, you, you know, you, you, everyone's, oh, but Gmail, everyone uses Gmail. Oh, but everyone uses Office. Well, yeah, not really. So that's that's the backstory. Um, uh, and with Microsoft, if you've got multi-factor authentication turned on, you can't use SMTP. You can use SMTP um, if they don't have multi-factor multi authentication turned on, but it's a bit of a pig. Um, there's, you have to set up application passwords and all kinds of things. Um, it's quite involved. So I'll give you the same advice I gave to Merle yesterday, which is that you shouldn't use Gmail or Office to send mails from your program. Rather use a mail service. And there's a lot of them. Um, we saw yesterday, we saw Postmark. There's also SendGrid. Uh, there's MailChimp, there's, uh, who else? There's lots and lots and lots of these things. I use send in blue. Um, and these are mail services. So they set up that they can accept SMTP mail, which means that um, you create, you know, the, 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 you or your customer, it, you can do it either way, would set up an account, let's say with SendGrid or Postmark, and you pay your 15 bucks a month or whatever it is, and you can send have him any mails they let you send, 10,000 mails, 100,000 mails, whatever it is. Um, and you can use your, your Gmail or Outlook from address. So it's not, a, it's, it's not that you're getting a new mail address. That's not what this is. You, you're still using the same mail address. You're just using a different mail sorting office, if we want to call it, if we want to use that analogy. So instead of using you know, the big popular one in the big city downtown, you're going to use the slightly smaller one. It's a little bit more local um, and it's, it's just going to work with your mail. So that's, 
in my opinion, the best route to go. I mean, you know, I am what I am. So I'm going to cave eventually into the APIs for Google and for Outlook for Office. Yeah. Um, but well, you're I not do going to go with a postmark or something like that? Or? Well, you don't have to do anything to do postmark. Postmark, SendGrid, SendBlue, they all support SMTP, which is the mail protocol. Right. Right. And right. that's what we want. Ultimately, you know, the one half of me is into, you know, their standards for a reason. Um, and just because companies get so big and so powerful, they feel they can just decide, uh, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, it's the Microsoft of old, if you, if you know, back in the 90s and so on, squash everyone else. Um, no mm -hmm. room for, for anything else. And, uh, you know, it rankles a little bit. I'm, I'm a little bit, if I'm feeling grouchy at the end of the day, then that, uh, that gets my blood going. But um, look, we'll do the APIs. At some point, it'll be invisible. It'll be under the hood. It'll just work. But it still feels wrong. I don't, I don't like it. So I should look into Postmark? Uh, yeah, Postmark. So Postmark was one we looked at yesterday in the open webinar, if you watch that recording. I'll look at it, yeah. Okay. Um, Mike Springer says he uses SMTP to go, um, and they send about 70,000 mails a month, and it works great. It's, it's, there, there's some value in, in setting up, you know, a mail service is, is who you're talking to, to send mail. Right. And you're talking to a business, they're in the business of sending mail. So they have... Um, they're set up to do it right. They've got mm. support. You can phone and all those kind of good things. Whereas if you're on Gmail, well, good luck with that. You know, if it doesn't go, it doesn't go. There's nothing going to happen. Happen, like you said. I can see that. Yeah. Um, so I know it's yeah, it's 15 bucks a month, but okay, or whatever it is, whatever they cost. You know, it's 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 a tiny number. Um, as as far as integrating, it's a simple integration. Well, there's nothing to do. You're just There's like passing data. You're just passing like command well, line and boom. It's not even that. It's it's the SMTP settings that you've already got in your program. Oh, yeah. That are, that are talking to Gmail. They just now talk to Postmark. Oh, they just use that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give um, it a try today. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you set up an account. So they give you a, a basically a user ID and a password. And those are what you're going to put in your program. Um, you don't have to change your code. It just works. Which webinar did you, was that yesterday you said? Or? Yesterday, yesterday's open webinar. If you go to youtube.com, oh, right, okay. yeah, youtube.com slash Karen live. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. And um, then you'll find it, yeah. yeah. All right, it's right toward it. the end, Ed. I'm, yeah. I'm working with Postmark. I'm adding it into positive right now. Okay. And the thing about Postmark is it'll do send and receive. So okay. the whole email thing will be within positive. And we're going to give people like a thousand, uh, if you're on the, on the, Gold subscription, it'll be like a thousand free emails a month or something that we're going to provide. So that's that's the way we're going anyway. Is the uh, postmark API? But I and talked about all that. Anything, yeah, right? Go, uh, Gmail, Office, anything. Well, to right? send to them, yeah, 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 to send in, and you can send things from Gmail to Postmark or the other way around. Yeah, I'm going to give it a try today. Thanks. I mean, they, first of all, you, you Google this stuff. They give you get conflict, not conflicting. You get in, you get information that's just not right. Yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but thanks. No, that was very helpful. There are actually settings for Office three sixty five, and I know. I mean, you know, lots of people are using it, but it's slowly falling out because of the two factor authentication. Someone at the customer says, "Oh, we're going to turn on two factor authentication on our Office three sixty five account," and suddenly your mail won't work anymore. It's a pain. Uh, Mark is saying, "I've tried. It doesn't work." Yeah, I mean, you've got to get you've got to get the magic the magic settings, the email server, the port, the SSL stuff. It all has to be just right. Um, yeah. And and obviously, if it's not, the Net Demo program can help you with that in terms of experimentation. But um, but like I said, it depends so much on the account now, and it's it's a it's a short fuse because once Google t kills it, then Microsoft's going to be close to, close to behind. Uh -huh. I'm going to give it a try today. Thanks. Cool. Mark says he set up his own mail server using HMail. So, um, yeah, Mark, I mean, you obviously can do that. We had the Capesoft email server for a long time. We, we ran our own mail servers. It's a pain, though. It's so much work because mail is such a moving target. Um, 
uh, from a server point of view, now you've got to start supporting uh, DKIM and other DNS stuff, and it's uh, it's just a pain. So we just we we felt that it wasn't core to our business. We moved over to Send in Blue is the one we use at the moment, but um, yeah, we kind of dropped that. Mm. Anyway, but you can obviously host your own mail server. That also works. Right. Can I, I have another question regarding Chrome Explorer. Yes, Ed, go for it. Um, so I purchased it with version one. There was an upgrade to two, right? Was that a paid upgrade or? There was, yes. Came oh. out last Friday. I don't know. It's okay. Because I, I looked on the, I didn't see any upgrade course. So. Oh, uh, I can did show I miss you. it? You did. Let's go to the accessories page. Whoops, not wrong one. Accessories. Maybe I just Everyone should have this page over by accident. Because this part, uh, Chrome Explorer 2, did a cost. There we go. <whistles> da, 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 that one there. Let's see, my screen's not updating, so. Oh, wait a second. Oops. I kind of lost the screen. Uh, how much is it? <laughs> 99 bucks. Oh, you, 90, you, okay. So yeah. my question is, I haven't implemented it yet. So I'm, I'm still using File Explorer. Okay. I'm using the, uh, this phone's ringing like crazy. The, um, the document uh, object model. Did I get it yeah. right? DOM? Uh, it's, uh, well, it's, it's an OLE control. control. Right. So uh, I've been but, using it successfully for many years. Yes, so I've been yes. hesitant to convert over to Chrome Explorer, but sure. will I still be able to do what I've been doing, what I was doing with File Explorer? I, yeah, the short answer is yes. The longer right. answer is um, you will recode it, right? Because Chrome Explorer is different to File Explorer. It's not a, it's not a, um, it's not the it's not an it's not the same engine. It's a very new class. So it's got all new class, all new stuff. So you'll you'll look at what you were doing with the uh, the old one, and right. you'll say, okay, well, how do I want to now code that in this one? Um, it'll be completely new. But and without knowing what you're doing, it's hard to be categorical and say you absolutely can. But um, I'm I'm pretty sure you can because Chrome Explorer lets you do lots of things, and we keep adding to it. So. If you hit something you couldn't do, then I'd be interested and we can explore how to do it. I'm wondering, should I bother trying to upgrade now to Chrome Explorer or should I wait until what I'm doing with File Explorer no longer works? <laughs> That's up to you. I'm not sure. Um, so the biggest problem with File Explorer is, and I haven't tested this yet, um, but I believe that the OLE control is not available under Windows 11. So, it simply won't work. Now, I take that with a big pinch of salt because I haven't tested it. It's just what people have told me. Um, and I don't believe people until I've tested it. Okay. But sooner or later, obviously you can't really browse much of the web anymore with File Explorer because nothing supports IE, which is the, which is the control underneath File Explorer. Um, so you, a lot of sites you get to will say, oh, uh, this JavaScript error or that JavaScript error right. or something like that nature. But if you're doing like HTML editing and stuff like that, it'll work as long as there's an IE control on the window. Now, the reason why I probably recommend upgrading in your timeline rather than the inevitable panic timeline is because you get to do it at your pace and right. and all those kind of good things. The problem you're going to have is the client who phones up and says, it doesn't work. And you discover they bought a new machine and it doesn't work on that machine. And at that moment in time, you've got you know, a day, two days or whatever to get a new build out. And it may not be a very convenient time to mm. be starting to replace all that. You might be busy doing something else. So it's an inevitable upgrade. I mean, IE control is going to go away, whether it's in Windows 11 or later, who knows? Um, it is going to go away. So okay. if you're using IE, yeah, you, you can, you know, it's worth making the effort and then it's not a thing that you have to worry about. Does the IE control work with Windows 11? I haven't tested it. But I haven't okay. tested it either. Oh. And, and that's something. Um, Keep my fingers that, crossed. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm told it doesn't. We could test it. Oh, now. really? Uh, yeah, oh, really. No. Um, uh, let me see. I can test it now. Let me just grab one. Right, so there's a demo. Uh, 
Well, that's going to force me to change over. Yeah. Well, let's let's, let's test it because I don't. I I've heard rumors, but sometimes what happens is that the beta versions of Windows go out and doesn't have the control, and then everyone has a flat panic about it. Um, and then Windows go, Microsoft goes, oh, no, 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 that's just, you know, we didn't get around to adding it in. And then they put it in the final one. So I'm just going to add. Uh, so, uh, but there's a program, right? Browser. And the address there is uh, campsoft.com. All right, that's going to be ask us to be. Yes, campsoft.com. Okay, so we know it works. This is now what you're looking at is Windows 10. Now, through the magic of the internet, uh, if you give me a minute, I am going to go there and I'm going to copy this folder. Open container folder. I've got a lot of things going on here. Uh, da, da, da. We won't. I won't bring in the. Uh, that you just got type. I'm just going to bring in the program and the DLLs. Presumably, that's all we need. Right now, I'm going to stop this machine sharing, and I'm going to go to this machine. I'm going to say share screen. I'm going to share this one here. So now I think you can see my Windows 11 machine. And if this program runs, Windows wants to scan it. Right. So if I can move that over there. Right. Let's go and see. Browser. HTTPS. Kipsoft.com. Now it still seems to be working for now under Windows 11. So it must okay. have been a beta or something else that didn't have it. But um, I mean, it's not, you know, you can't really browse random web pages with it because you'll right. get a, you'll get a login error, um, a JavaScript error very quickly. Um, but for now you should be okay. Oh, but one day it will go away. Yeah. Code it's that I was using in File Explorer, you know, with the uh, the DOM model, where you it's sort of like you know, read this, click this, if it, if that, click this. Is it kind of the same thing with Chrome Explorer? Yeah. Um, so let me jump back. So uh, stop sharing and start sharing there. Oh, this one. Yes. Okay, we're back there. Let me get back to the documentation. So in the Chrome Explorer docs, there's a lot of things about how to um, how to do stuff. So that's all these common techniques. Mm. So you've got things like preventing navigation or redirecting navigation, inspecting the request, clicking an element on the page, setting a value on the page, all of those all kind right. of things. Yeah, that's what I gotta uh, do, all right. Yeah. So it's it's new code. But uh, but you can you can drive the page in that sense, yes. And there's a good demo of that. Yeah, something like a, yeah, yeah. The okay. demo is reasonable. Um, uh, the documentation is reasonable as well. So you you got to read through the docs and, and get a hang for what you uh, you know the hang of what you're doing. And then um, the, the the demo does have specific things. Let's uh, let's come out here. Do, do, do the examples, Chrome Explorer, if you see. And it was version two of Chrome Explorer a big update or not that? Um, it was a quite a big update under the hood. I missed the um, that. Yeah, there I'll was, there was a, re a release webinar two Fridays ago, so about right. 13 days ago now. Um, it's it's under the hood, it's hard, to, you know, it, what you're gonna see between one and two is very similar. Um, obviously, you know, if there's any things we need to add, it'll get added in two. Um, 
under the hood, there was quite a big change because we've added the ability for JavaScript to call into Clarion and get a response back from Clarion, which is kind of a very big deal, albeit in a kind of uh, a non-intuitive way. Let me put it that way. Uh, so what you're talking about is uh, driving, da, 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 driving a website. So here, for example, I've got a page. Um, I can open my developer tools, which is my normal developer tools thing. I can go and inspect something on the page. Let's say that guy there. Oops, where's my developer tools gone there? Um, so that input text there, it's got a name, it's got an ID. So let me take the ID. And so the field selector is, and there's a thing in the docs about field selectors. That's, that's shorthand for ID. Um, you can select on class, you can select on name, you can select on ID, you can do all kinds of things. Um, and let's set that value to Bruce Nelson. And we can say set value and we fill it in the field. Um, if we had a button, we can click on the button and that kind of thing. So there's a button and we can use the developer tools. We can inspect that button. And do, do, do. Oh. <laughs> this is the one window, the one screen, oh man, the one screen approach to things. There's the button. Uh, so now in this case, the ID is, it's gonna change every time it's a random value um, because the way it's generated. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull out this attribute here, data do equals save. Um, and again, there's documentations on attributes, but I can see data do equals save. And in square brackets means I'm looking for an attribute. Uh, and we're going to click it. So we're going to say, click on that. Uh, now it's complaining because I haven't filled in that field. So you you, you drive the site as it were. Um, selectors are part of HTML. Selectors, 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 selectors. There. So you can select stuff on the page. So we use the ID thing there. Uh, and we also use the attribute equals value there. Back in File Explorer, you had this nice demo program where it would load all the elements and list every element. You could figure out what was going on. Do you have the same yeah. thing in Chrome Explorer? I don't know. Let's have a look, see. Let's get rid of that. Uh, do, 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 do. Read page values. And uh, do, 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 do. Uh, 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 this is the opposite. This is reading stuff off. Um, well, yeah, it was a nice listing of all the elements. Yeah, With I'm. I don't think I've particularly yeah. done it in here. No. Um, cunningly, that that actually isn't a file explorer thing. It's it's just getting all the HTML and just parsing through the HTML, which is so that's oh, right. outside of file explorer, but. But yeah, I mean, that, that we could add that if we wanted to. That'd it's, be it's, nice. I appreciate it would that. Be nice. Yeah. It, um, it's not it a big deal. It's very useful, the, that's why. Yeah. I mean, for what you're doing at the moment, if it's fixed, obviously it's all the same stuff. But, yeah, but sometimes um, they change things on me. I gotta, go, I gotta be a detective sometimes and find it. <laughs> well, it's nice with the dev tools being in here. You can yeah. do the dev tools thing straight away and you can test it and so on. Okay. So, well, thank yeah. you. Sorry to digress from that talk. No, it's all right. I don't see any other questions. Well, they weren't in a moment ago, so yeah. All right, um, so worth it. Cool. Nice to see you, Ed. All right, thank you. Same here. Pleasure. Right now, Victor has a question about string theory, and it seems like we're doing well. It's part of my web program. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good enough excuse, Victor. <laughs> I'll I'll take it. Uh, I've got the, I did something, I was checking to make sure that certain characters were in a string before. And so I'm wondering if that's just kind of the best way of doing it using the in string. 
If you, so, so you better ask the question because no one's heard it. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm uploading an ASCII table, and um, when the the information is being created as from to the CSV file from an Excel spreadsheet, uh, the Excel spreadsheet wants to put in an apostrophe as the first character of the field to make sure that the field is a text field instead of a numeric field. And when and when the ASCII table is created, that that apostrophe is still coming over, which I need to remove. Okay. But it won't be there always. Some people are not doing the apostrophe. Some people are. OK, um, so you've, you've got the field. I mean, you've got you know, the name Bruce or whatever it is. It sometimes has Correct. apostrophe on the front, but sometimes not. So well, the, 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 the data in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the easiest way to to get the first character well, there's three ways, really. The first is sub. If you do a sub one, um, and the default is one. So if you do sub one, you're gonna get the first character. You can also use slice, which cunningly will also be slice one <laughs> because it's mm -hmm. just the one character. Uh, the imposition, of the, uh, actually, no, you'd have to say slice one comma one. So that's a different thing. You can also use left. Um, left returns the first character or the first X number of characters from the string. Okay. So, the the got you is how do I check to make sure that that's an apostrophe? What do I, you know, because you can't say, because it didn't like it if I said, you know, if equal to, um, apostrophe three apostrophes basically said so then the string oh, wasn't terminated no, no, no. it's it's not yeah you're not three it's four so okay um, if you think about it so you'll say if whatever equals so we've got a string and inside our string we've got a single quote but in clarin if you put a single quote in a string you have to put two okay so you end up with four that's the actual character and that's the string boundary. Another way some people like to do it is to put 39 because a, a single quote oh, is okay. ASCII 39. True. Right. Um, and, and some people feel that that reads better, which it does if you know what 39 is. Right. Um, and you have to do that in the filters all the time. So they should know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, right. I just ran into that one 10 minutes ago, so it was perfect well, timing. There you go. That's, <laughs> that's how we like to do it, you know? Yeah. Get a question, answer a question. Okay. Yeah, the Lord directs. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, John. What? Do you have a question? <laughs> Does Ted have a question? Yeah. Look up that sub again, real quick. Uh, the, in the uh, browser, <laughs> sub. Yeah. 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 String theory, sub. And I have to go back to the top methods sub. So sub 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 okay yeah so you don't have to put any parameters in because it starts at one and it's a length of one. <laughs> you're right. That would <laughs> you're right. That would be very um unintuitive to read though. I would always say sub. I always put the first one in. Not putting the first one in does seem a little. Um, you're right. You you can pass sub sub yeah sub bracket bracket. Could fine. I'm just saying you could. That's all. You could. You could. <laughs> um, but the poor reader, it's not obvious to the person who's reading the code what that's going to do. So I would tend to put the first character. But that's just me. So Did like in my both. case, I you, you could do if sub bracket bracket I'll, equals thirty nine. Yeah. 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 If if whatever string theory dot sub, so if if st dot sub equals thirty nine. But like I say, I would always put sub one because, and in fact, I tend to use left one because when it with left, I'm saying ah, I know it's the first. You know, there's something about that word in the code that tells you it's the first character. It's the left hand side. You can do the same with the right actually. If you want to know what the last character in the string is, you can use right or the last two characters. Um, that's that's a really useful trick. Um, and I'm always, I'm always about trying to make the code kind of say what it's doing. And obviously sub one does tell you what it's doing. If you want to be presenting sub one comma one. Um, 
Sub sub one comma one tells you what it's doing. Sub one doesn't. Yeah. Cunningly slice so, one comma one does. Um, yeah. Would also do the same. So there's lots of ways to skin the cat, and, and really it's it's a whatever floats your boat you can use. Um, I just I'm the poor guy who has to come read it in six months' time, and I can't remember what I've done. So, well, um, you're the one that put the, you know, you made the parameter so that it had a value. So okay. you should take that value out if you really want people to do it. Cunningly, I probably didn't. I'm <laughs> gonna I'm gonna throw, throw Rick under the bus with that one. So it was probably him. You think so? Okay. Rick or Sean. Um, the, the, the defaults we've got lots of default values for parameters, yeah. And uh, Mark's saying uh, he, he missed something. Where did he collect the session ID from the network cloud after pitching a URL? Um, you don't have to, Mark. If you've got option auto cookie turned on, then it automatically passed the incoming session ID, which was in a you know, set cookie header, and put it into the cookies queue and it sends it out with your next request. Okay, so, but supposing that I'm looping through a collection of URLs from my polling program, then I would have a different session ID for each of those. It'll no, still you want do the to, right thing. You want the same. You want the same session ID for all of them, don't you? Uh, if they're going to different web servers, the session yeah, wouldn't be the same. Doesn't actually matter. It doesn't matter. Though you can you can force the session ID. So um, as long as you're not logging in or anything, it's fine. It'll just work. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you want to, if you want to look at it, it's in the cookie queue. So there's a good get cookie. If you did a get cookie session ID, you'll find it. Thank you. Doop -doop -doop. Right. And if you don't, just shout, uh, and then send me an email after you've done shouting. Again, cool. thank you. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Ted, did you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions today. Thank you for asking. Sure. The, um, John, what's happening tomorrow? Um, it's going to be a short one tomorrow because we had a plan and then Mike says, oh, I can't make it. So uh, we thought we'd do catch up on these things I've been talking about for the past, oh, last month mostly, but they never actually got released out into the wild like the uh drop down address thing with the mapping oh, okay yes you know that didn't get released yet so i'll get i'm trying to put all these things together today and then tomorrow we'll talk about them again and show you where you can download them and then we'll say goodbye <laughs> so it's going to be one of those don't, whatever don't else away. we can think to chat about don't run away sorry i do have a question CIDC okay. 2020, Bruce, the website seems to be still blocked from Australia. Um, uh, when you say blocked, do you see anything at all? No. The ISP is saying this has malicious content. Yes. So a number of, um, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, antivirus companies or whatever, um, a small number decided to add CIDC 2020 to their malicious content list for reasons that... I get that good. impression, yes. No. Um, I've spoken to Norton, I've spoken to Avast, and they've both, and I say spoken, I just filled out a form on their webpage that said, please reevaluate the site, um, which they did, and they've both given it the all clear. Um, so, ideally, you get some clue in your browser page there as to who is blocking it, which which service is blocking it. And, and ideally you just report to that service and say, um, hey, this you're blocking this URL and it shouldn't be blocked. Um, I, I will but, follow it yeah, through. It's not on my side. It's, it's definitely a false positive. Um, for some other reason, it got into, and there's there, there was a page of, of a whole of all these services. There's a page I, I don't know the URL, um, and it's there was a site that that went to all the services. You could type in an address, and we'd go to all the services and tell you what they all thought. And there was the small number that thought it was malicious, and this large number that thought it was perfectly okay. And um, so I, I wrote the, the ones who I had reported were Norton and Avast. I wrote to them. And they both turned, you know, they both did things, said, oh, yeah, no, we fixed it, our bad. So I don't know what caused it. 
Um, I have my suspicions, but I don't know. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dave. Follow it up from the if same point of view. Yeah. And if you don't come right, let me know and I'll try and figure it out, as in like figure out who it is. Um, and sometimes it's more helpful if I write a note because I can say, hey, I'm the site owner. You know, what do you want me to do? Um, that's what I did with Norton. But I know other people reported it to Norton. Other people reported it to other things as well. It came up last week. It started coming up in, in browsers as being hey, this is a malware site or what they were worried was phishing. This is, an, this is a known phishing site. And it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's not up there. Righty. Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the questions. We'll see you all again, same time, same place next week. And uh, until then, it's bye from me. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, bye for me. <laughs> and a bye for me.